I'm Kirk Olson. I'm a fisheries biologist covering Monroe, Vernon, La Crosse, and Crawford counties here in Wisconsin. Um, and so today I'll be talking about a, uh, a creel survey um, on the West Fork Kickapoo River, um, which is located uh, right in Vernon County, um, kind of in the heart of the, drift, heart of the driftless area. And uh, so, yeah, I'll be talking about a creel survey that we, we completed in, in the summer of 2022. And when I say we, I mean the uh, La Crosse Inland Fisheries Management Crew. Um, a lot of this work was done by folks other than me, um, which I'll acknowledge at the end, of course. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of get things started here. Let's see, hopefully this slide advances. There were a couple different reasons that we decided to do a Creole survey on the West Fork Kickapoo River um, last summer. Um, statewide, there's, there's kind of been an interest in having more uh, Creole surveys completed on our inland trout streams in Wisconsin. So this graph here shows the number of uh, inland creel surveys on you know our trout streams in Wisconsin by decade, and you can see not very many are completed on a um, you know even on a, a basis of a decade, and so there's um, there's been a real interest and kind of push to to get more of this information, which is really important for our our management, you know, kind of understanding understanding you know where the angular pressure is, you know, or evaluating our different management activities. So um, there's a statewide interest in having um, more of these creel surveys be completed on our trout streams. And at the same time, we had just completed a inland, um, or not inland, but we completed a watershed management report on the West Fork Kickapoo uh, watershed in 2021. And I identified that the West Fork Kickapoo River, um, it's one of our most popular trout streams. It seems to be, you know, on the surface anyway, very well known. Um, and, and a creel survey had never been completed there. So we recommended that a creel survey be, be completed. So um, we kind of these two two factors or these two things lined up and, and that's why a creel survey happened in, in the summer of 2022. So to kind of orient you a little bit, um, the West Fork Kickapoo River, like I mentioned, it's in Vernon County. Um, it's about a 24 mile long river. Um, I'll kind of go from headwaters down to the mouth with its confluence of the Kickapoo River, just to kind of give you a feel for uh, for kind of what it's like. Um, the headwaters, far headwaters, um, upstream of Jersey Valley Dam, um, are real high gradient, kind of your standard headwater driftless area stream, rocky, you know, riffle run pool, um, you know, some agricultural use, grazing and stuff upstream, but but in general, it's in it's in pretty good shape. It's also um, it's uh, brook trout only in this upper portion, and the brook trout are isolated from brown trout downstream by the Jersey Valley Dam. Um, but anyway, so with this Creole survey, we really won't be talking too much about this portion of the watershed. I just kind of want to um, give you an idea kind of how the, just give you a feel for the river. As you move downstream, you hit the Jersey Valley impoundment. It's about a 56 acre um, recreational impoundment that was constructed in uh, 1969. Um, and as I said, it was constructed for both recreational use and uh, flood control. Unfortunately, in 2018, the dam blew out with one of our major flood events that happened in the Driftless area, in this part of the Driftless area, where we got you know over 12 inches of rain in a period of 24 hours. And um, so currently, and the dam was partially repaired, um, you know, just kind of patched up basically on a temporary basis. And so currently, the water levels about 10 feet lower than it was uh, before the before the flood. And, um, you know, so the max depth now is about eight feet and the surface area is about two thirds of, of what it was uh, before the flood. So um, relatively shallow, um, does warm up the water a bit. Fortunately, just downstream of the uh, dam, there's several springs that come in to help buffer that. And so it is it is trout water all the way up to where, all the way up to the to where the water spills out of the dam. So, because we have that buffering effect of those springs. Um, in general, the upper uh, half of the West Fork Kickapoo is class, considered class one, having a high level of natural reproduction. And then kind of the lower half of the West Fork Kickapoo is considered class two, um, having lower uh, amounts of natural reproduction. Uh, but anyway, kind of continuing downstream here, moving into the middle portion of the, uh, of the river near Avalanche, kind of hits the sweet spot in terms of, you know, fishability, sort of the size um, of the stream, the banks aren't really high yet, you know, with that historic sediment, you know, being built up in some places like you get further downstream. It's got a nice riffle run pool sort of structure. We've got a lot of easements through this middle portion of the river. Um, there's been a lot of habitat work done in the past year as well. So 
um, kind of the middle portion appears to be, uh, you know, pretty important for, for anglers and where a lot of our fishing pressure happens. As you move further downstream, similar to our other large river systems or larger, you know, trout stream systems in the driftless, uh, you get kind of these taller banks with the historic um, sediment, you know, deposition and kind of sandy, sandy stream bottoms, kind of a meandering, uh, kind of continuous run. Uh, trout densities are a little bit lower down here, but you also find larger trout. And in general, access is also a little bit less in this lower portion of the lower portion of the of the river. <clears throat> um, going back and the figured I'd talk a little bit about the history of the West Fork just really briefly. I think it's it's always amazing to go back in the files and 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 see what's been said about some of our our the trout streams that we have now and and just to you know witness the amazing change that's happened over the past 50, 60 years. So if you go back in our files. Um, you know, this note from 1956, you know, they surveyed over 7,000 feet of the West Fork Kickapoo and didn't catch a single trout. Um, and they recommended against even stocking trout in the West Fork Kickapoo. In 75, you know, they had begun stocking trout in the Kickapoo and had some carryover. But given the poor habitat, um, they recommended against even uh, doing habitat improvement projects or land acquisition because conditions were so poor in the West Fork. Um, which kind of is pretty amazing when you think about the change that happened between then and the 1990s. Um, in 1999, the West Fork Kickapoo was identified in that Trout Unlimited book is uh, one of America's best 100 trout streams. And so between, um, you know, and over the course of about 50, 60 years, there was a, a massive improvement in the trout population there which was a result of improved agricultural practices that were finally paying dividends as, um, you know, basically conditions when it rained, more that rainwater reached the aquifer and fed that and provided that cold water base flow and um, more suitable temperatures for trout. At the same time, uh, DNR, uh, Black Hawk chapter of Trout Unlimited and the West Fork Sportsman's Club were doing habitat work um, in the middle portion of the river, and uh, DNR was stocking uh, feral strain or wild wild strain uh, brook and brown trout. So, kind of combination of these factors likely led to the rapid recovery of uh, of trout that we had in uh, West Fork Kickapoo. So, now it's uh, the West Fork Kickapoo is often featured in these lists of you know top trout fishing spots in Wisconsin or, and and so forth. So. It seems to be a pretty well-known stream based on kind of what you see in the media um, and what you hear from anglers. And it's uh, just kind of amazing the, the, the story there, um, like a lot of trout streams in, in the Driftless area. Harvest regulations on the West Fork um, in 19, we'll just kind of start in 1990. Uh, it was changed from kind of a county-based regulation to uh, catch and release in the middle seven miles of the river, uh, which was done as, you know, Fisheries managers at the time began to realize the potential of the stream as natural reproduction began to take off. Uh, they thought there might be some opportunity for some really quality um, fishing and there were some concerns of harvest. Um, and the remainder of the stream was a th uh, three bag uh, with a 12 inch minimum length limit. In 2016, there was an interest statewide to reduce angling complexity and to create more opportunities um, for angling and harvest where it made biological sense. And so this uh, catch and release regulation um, was removed and it went, the West Fork Kickapoo went back to sort of a county based regulation of five bag um, with a no minimum length limit. And that's the regulation that's currently in place in the West Fork. Um, and there's a good amount of uh, evidence from other creel surveys and our you know, uh, stream population surveys as well that uh, there's relatively little impact um, from angling harvest. So there was, good potential for creating more opportunities for harvest on the stream without having an impact on this on the uh, quality fishing that existed there. In terms of uh, stocking and habitat, here's a graph that just kind of shows our stocking on the West Fork. Only going back to 1970, of course, you know, these streams have been stocked with trout going back to the late 1800s. Um, but this, these are the data that we have. Uh, um, in our database. And so anyway, you can see sometime around 1990 to 2000, we, we had tapered off our stocking of brown trout, switched over to brook trout. This was as, um, you know, we began stocking those feral strain, strain brook, or uh, sorry, feral strain brown trout. Um, habitat conditions were improving. 
you know, both because of improve, improvements in hydrology and also some of our habitat restoration projects. And so natural reproduction was taking off in brown trout. So then we kind of switched over to stocking these native, our native brook trout, of course, um, and it's tapered off, um, you know, and brook trout stopping, stocking kind of tapered off as well. And we switched to just stocking yearling, um, uh, wild strain brook trout at a rate of about 2000 fish. Uh, annually. And so that's about how many fish are stocked annually into the West Fork are about 2000 brook trout, which are raised with the help of, um, with the help of our cooperatives. And this, this map here, I, I realize it's pretty small, um, a lot of detail there, but really this shows our, where habitat permits, habitat uh, restoration permits have been um, given out, I guess. And so I just wanted to point out that a lot of the habitat work on the West Fork happened in the 90s and it happened kind of in this middle portion of the other river, um, kind of around Avalanche. So uh, with all that, um, kind of get into the details of our creel survey in 2022. Um, we did a creel survey on about 18.7 miles of, uh, of river. Um, there were about 13 access points within this, within this area um, and in, in total the uh, the angling season, including both the catch and release and the harvest season was about 223 angling days. Um, and we had one creel, creel clerk hired, uh, we were able to hire one creel clerk to kind of cover this. So um, that really informed the design that we ended up using, which is a bus route creel design, which is ideal for the situations where you've got um, a really diffuse angler pressure. You've got lots of access points. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not just one like boat ramp, for example, where you could do a, you know, a different type of creel survey. So anyway, we use this bus route creel design. Um, and so with our creel clerk, uh, he had, you know, assigned times at each access point. And the time at each access point was um, determined based on uh, our expected angler use from kind of just our best professional judgment before the creel survey started. We randomized uh, start location, direction of travel, um, and then also the whether you had an AM or PM shift, and so all this randomization is just to just to make sure we're not introducing any sort of bias, you know, inadvertently to our data. So just kind of standard protocol for these creel surveys. We also stratified um, our creel survey by day of week, um, so weekends and weekdays were stratified separately because we expect there to be different types of anglers with you know different amounts of pressure, maybe different numbers of anglers per vehicle and different harvest rates. So we stratified by day of week and then also by period. So catch and release um, early season was a strata, and then the month of May was its own strata, and then June, July, August, and then September, October. Those are all separated out based on our ex expectation of there being um, differences among those groups in terms of angler pressure and harvest and, and so on. Um, our creel clerk had an eight hour workday um, with drive time. That's about six hours of creeling, uh, three consecutive work days, or sorry, three consecutive weekdays that were randomly assigned during the week and about a 50% chance of a weekend shift on, on average. So um, not every weekend, uh, the creel clerk didn't have to work every weekend, which I'm sure he was glad about. Um, and the, the creel clerk, you know, at each of these access points um, at arrival, did a car count, at departure, did a car count, and then in between, um, collected interviews from, from anglers that had finished fishing. And then also for anglers who hadn't finished fishing, put on these self-addressed um, mailers so we could increase our, our, our interviews because sometimes it's hard to catch um, folks as they're, as they're wrapping up fishing. So in terms of our analysis of these data, uh, you know, first just estimated vehicle hours for each site and within each of those stratum that I described, and then use those vehicle hours, convert those vehicle hours to angler hours um, based on the average number of anglers per vehicle for each, which is estimated for each of those stratum individually. And then you, we end up with uh, average angler hours per day, and then that's expanded to the, to the stratum. Um, you know, based on that, that average and then the number of days within that stratum. And then, well, we also estimated variance in 95% confidence intervals, but um, I'm not going to explain the details on those. If you're interested, feel free to send me a message. Um, but basically, we followed the, the methods of Pollock and the um, AFS book that was published in 1995. 
So um, getting into some results, uh, there were only about 212 days that were actually fishable because we had, uh, surprisingly, we had a decent amount of ice cover earlier in the season and the river was basically not fishable throughout much of its length. And um, we also had some some floods and some uh, some kind of, you know, thunderstorms, uh, thunderstorm warnings where we, you know, it was kind of thunderstorming throughout the day. And so we just said, well, let's just cancel the creel. So anyway, about 212 fishable days of the 223, um, we ended up having to reduce our weekend or sorry, our weekday shifts from three to two, um, just because we had some changes in staffing. Um, and it ended up, I think still ended up getting a really good sample, 93 creel shifts. And that was about a total of 21% coverage of the, of the, uh, the angling, uh, season during 2022, which, um, you know, is, is a pretty decent sample when you're thinking about ecological, uh, you know, sampling. Um, and so in total, we estimated about just under 12,000 angler hours were expended on the West Fork Kickapoo River in 2022. On average, trip length uh, was about 3.1 hours, which gives us about 3,861 trips. And if you want to think about that kind of in terms of stream mile, that's one trip per mile per day. So um, yeah, just kind of give you an idea of the density. Um, how does this compare, you know, angler hours, what does 12,000 angler hours mean? Um, so, you know, there's not, like I mentioned, there's not a ton of, uh, creel surveys out there that we can directly compare these two within, in Wisconsin, but there's a handful. And, uh, it's kind of what we saw was that the West Fork Kickapoo is comparable to some of our other high quality trout streams in the state. So like the White River in Bayfield, Ashland County, um, it was this slightly exceeded the level that they saw there. Um, based on an average from 84 to 2015, but it's not as high as, say, the Bois Brule in northern Wisconsin, which is one of our top um, trout streams, and that's just the, the inland fishery for the Bois Brule there, so um, yeah, so it's up it's up in that upper uh, kind of class of trout streams in the state, but, you know, not necessarily our, our top trout stream, but it, it's it's up there, and it gets a good amount of pressure. In terms of, you know, how concentrated is the pressure, here's a graph showing angler hours per mile per day, um, it's actually not that high when you think about it in terms of, you know, spatially and uh, temporally. Um, it's in the lower 25th percentile when compared to other creel surveys that have been done in the state since the 80s. Um, so, you know, if you're out there fishing, it may not feel like a lot of pressure um, because it's spread out. Um, throughout the season, angler pressure varied. Um, May was our, our period of highest angler hours per day. It dipped down, there's a big lull in June, June, July, and August, and then picked up again in September, October. And we see this um, in other creel surveys in the state. It always is kind of surprising to me because I really enjoy fishing that June, you know, in June and August in particular, and it seems like the number of anglers really kind of dips off and then picks back up in the fall again. <clears throat> kind of spatially, how was our pressure um, allocated? And so these points, the bigger they are, the more pressure there was. As you can see, a lot of our angler pressure happened in the middle portion of the river. Um, moving on, here's the uh, total number of brown trout caught that we estimated in 2021. So about 19,000 browns were, were, were caught, um, caught and released. And uh, in total, about 536 browns were kept. Most of those browns were kept in the month of May, um, which is kind of what you'd expect. Um, based on other creel surveys and kind of what we know about um, kind of harvest, uh, uh, trout harvest behaviors among anglers in Wisconsin seems to be that a lot of harvest happens in May. Um, here's a, a, just a, a map again showing catches of brown trout. So catches of brown trout were pretty much in line. We had higher catches where we had higher effort. It made sense. Um, interestingly, our harvest was not, didn't really line up with our effort. We actually had slightly higher harvest kind of in the lower, kind of skewed towards the lower sites in the river. Whereas, you know, around Avalanche and at our, you know, bridge in Avalanche, there's actually relatively little uh, harvest. So it's kind of interesting there. I'm not really sure why, but uh, why that plays out like that. But I, yeah, something to look into. Um, moving on to brook trout. Well, um, brook trout are also present in the river. Uh, as I mentioned, we stocked about 2,000 fish there annually. There's a decent amount of natural reproduction and some of the small tribs and those fish end up in the West Fork Kickapoo as well. But anyway, we caught, our anglers caught about 2,000 brook trout in 2021 or 
yeah, sorry, 2022, and not, that was about 9% of all trout that were caught that, that year. Total kept only 33, and that's about 6% of the, the harvest that year. Here's a brook trout in terms of catch. Uh, again, the catch was pretty much lined up with where effort was. And harvest, uh, again, was a little bit skewed towards those lower sites for some reason. Our catch rates were pretty darn high on the West Fork, uh, two fish for every 1.1 hour, which is uh, really a, you know, a pretty high catch rate. Uh, and our harvest rate was very low. So although people were catching a lot of fish, they were, and they were able to harvest fish because the regulation is quite liberal, um, people weren't harvesting fish. They were choosing to release them. And so we had harvest rate of one trout harvested per every 20.7 hours of, of fishing that happened. So with the data that we have, we can also come up with a real rough uh, estimate of exploitation. So, you know, what does this, you know, 580 brown trout mean? Um, so let's say, you know, taking that and expanding or dividing it along the length of the river that we surveyed, that's about 29 brown trout harvested per mile. Um, we have electrofishing data from 2019 and 2020, which, um, you know, isn't from the year that we did the creel survey, but it should give us an okay idea of kind of what um, densities look like. So we got 482 brown trout cap captured per mile, and that's age one and older, catchable size brown trout on average in the West Fork. And let's say our presumed electrofishing catch rate is 80%, which is a really conservative estimate because we know that on these lower sites, our catch rate is probably more like 40%. So playing this really conservatively, we'll say there's about 602 brown trout per mile. Give this an exploitation rate of around 6%, which is um, pretty low when you think about, um, say, other uh, fish species uh, exploitation rates that we see commonly in Wisconsin, like walleye, um, which are much longer lived, um, later maturing, um, our exploitation rates in seeded territory are often getting up to the 20, 30% um, level. So 6% is a very low uh, exploitation rate. So a very safe exploitation in terms of uh, population stability. Uh, one other thing I looked at here was uh, kind of size structure of the trout that were harvested. And interestingly, um, well, I guess maybe not interestingly, it probably is expected. Most anglers basically weren't harvesting fish under nine inches. Uh, there was a bit of a skew towards those larger fish being harvested. While there's still a good number of fish smaller than that, that, that anglers are, that are in the population that anglers are deciding not to harvest, even though they can with the regulation. Angler demographics, um, about half of our anglers were fishing with um, spinning gear, the other half fishing with fly. And the month of May and September, October, those two strata is where we had bait anglers. Otherwise, you know, we didn't, didn't have any in our sample anyway. Um, yeah, uh, so moving on here. In terms of uh, angler demographics, distance traveled here on the, the X axis. So most of our anglers were traveling from more than 50 miles away. And the type of equipment or type of, uh, you know, bait used, whether it was lure, live bait, or fly, didn't change based on how far the angler was was traveling so it's not um wasn't that all of our local anglers were fishing with live bait they had we had similar percentages of lure live bait and fly anglers for those local anglers as we did for those anglers that were traveling from further away um in terms of demographics uh similar to what um, was seen in iowa you know most of the anglers were male and most of them were sort of middle age 31 to 64. um so pretty much pretty similar to what other folks have seen so just to kind of summarize those results, we saw relatively high angler pressure. A lot of it was concentrated in the middle portion of the river. We saw peaks in, in uh, pressure and harvest in May and September. Our catch rate is really high on the West Fork Kickapoo, around two trout per hour, um, which probably reflects the good access and good habitat and pretty high trout densities that we have on the West Fork Kickapoo. Although anglers can harvest fish and they're catching fish, the harvest is really low and the fish that are harvested, it, it appears to be size selective. Anglers aren't really keeping anything less than nine inches. And we also see that harvest is a little bit greater on the lower portion of the river for some reason. About half of our anglers are using spin fishing equipment, other half are fly fishing. Most are men aged 31 to 64 that have traveled from more than 50 miles away uh, to fish the river. <clears throat> so in, in conclusion, uh, West Fork Kickapoo, you know, based on the, the amount of pressure that we saw there, we can say it's a pretty important fishery. It's in the same level as some of those other high quality fisheries in northern Wisconsin, maybe not our, our top, top level, like we see, you know, not the same level as like the Bois Brule, but um, it's, it's on, on par with, say, the White River um, in northern Wisconsin. Um, 
the current regulation appears to be very sustainable based on our rough exploit estimate of exploitation. Um, there's a self-imposed catch and release going on and harvest is extremely limited. Um, one thing that was interesting and might be worth considering in the future is harvest did appear to be somewhat size selective. So um, something we might be looking at in the future, um, you know, although overall uh, angler harvest was so low that it, I wouldn't expect much of an impact from that. But anyway, um, pressure catch and harvest, they weren't also, they weren't evenly spread across, across sites. A lot of our pressure and our catch happened in the middle portion of the river while our harvest was kind of skewed a little bit towards those lower sites. So with that, uh, definitely want to acknowledge Ryan Olson, who was our creel clerk, who was out there every day. And anyone who's ever done a creel survey um, knows how it can be extremely tedious and a difficult, it's a really difficult job, but he did an awesome job um, getting out there and getting those creel surveys and um, getting those interviews. So thanks, thanks, um, thanks to Ryan. Also, thanks to Kevin Mall, who's uh, now moved upstairs to the DOT, our, our longtime fisheries technician here. And uh, thanks to Heath Benneke, our, our supervisor, for uh, uh, kind of encouraging us to get uh, this creel survey done. So with that, well, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Kirk. Um, I'm looking in the section here. Okay, uh, got a question. For those of us who take fish, do you have recommendations for what size they should be or you know, what you observe there? Is that generally acceptable? Yeah, I mean, um, it kind of depends on what the goal is for the, you know, for the water. I think generally, you know, oftentimes um, well, a goal is to have quality sized trout as well. And then so in those cases where we're looking to have quality sized trout, um, you know, maybe if you're harvesting, you'd want to try to harvest, you know, some of those small fish make up a large percentage of the population. So I would encourage people to go ahead and harvest a seven, eight, uh, nine incher, uh, you know, and not uh, shy away from harvesting those. We don't have uh, we don't have limitations in, in natural reproduction or recruitment. Um, and then consider, you know, releasing some of the larger fish if you know you're interested in maintaining a quality uh, fishery or quality sizes of fish. Um, and if that's a goal for that stream, then yeah, I would I would do that. I guess also the question came up about similar to what we asked Iowa, um, are there efforts that you're undertaking to try to reduce the pressure on the Kickapoo and, you know, encourage pressure elsewhere? Yeah. So I think um, there already is a, a pretty good amount of um, angler pressure that's spread out on some of these smaller tributaries to the West Fork. And I think a lot of people are, you know, I think, in Wisconsin, I think most of our anglers now are aware that there's more than just one, you know, it's not just the West Fork and the Timber and Timber Coulee anymore. Um, but yeah, with that said, you know, we've uh, statewide, there's um, lots of different resources where, you know, not just if you just take a peek in our regulations pamphlet, for example, we've got a map where you can kind of see, wow, there's a lot of trout water and it's not just these couple streams. So um, in addition to that, we've got some online resources too, like the, the trout tool, um, where people can see where habitat work's been done, where easements are, and uh, the classifications of the trout stream. So yeah, there's a good amount of information out there. And I think uh, I think people are definitely fishing these other small waters um, now and not just focusing on a couple of streams in the area. Um, had a question whether or not the higher harvest rates and the lower reaches would be due to a higher concentration of larger fish in that area. Is that something you... Hmm looked at when you worked at the result? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that that's possible. Um, you know, maybe the the folks who are deciding to harvest fish, or maybe if there's a sort of a self-imposed minimum length limit that they're just catching more of the big fish down there. So um, yeah, that, yeah, that could be. Um, one other thing that kind of crossed my mind too was uh, it might just be that, you know, for a long time it was catch and release in that middle portion. And I kind of wonder if there's, you know, just still a group of people who, you know, were harvest anglers who fished that lower portion of the other river when it was catch and release upstream and who mm -hmm. have just kind of stuck with that out of tradition, you know? So, but yeah, it's just kind of a, I don't really have any solid data for that, but yeah, just, uh, it could be that as well, that there's just larger fish down there. Um, <clears throat> had a question. It says, um, someone's observed several handshake agreements for access on the West Fork have expired. 
Are there strategies to pursue more permanent easements mm-hmm. on the West Fork? Yeah, um, for sure. We have an active um, easement purchasing program. And um, yeah, I mean, we've uh, we purchased an easement not too long ago downstream of County Highway. Um, what was that? S and Avalanche um, short, sec- short, short segment there. And then we're purchasing another one. Um, oh gosh, where's that at? I think it's the next, actually the next downstream because S crosses three times. Anyway, yeah, we do have an active easement purchasing program and uh, we're interested in purchasing easements. And, um, you know, when we, you know, run into a landowner and they seem interested, I'll always mention it to them. Um, and so, yeah, if anyone had knows of landowners on the West Fork Kickapoo who want to sell an easement, um, we have the funds to to go after those. So yeah, definitely contact me. Excellent. Well, I'll do one more question since we're up to the break and I'm, I won't delay anybody. Um, we had a question asking if you think we'll see more of the spin fishing with anglers than expected as they continue to do creel surveys in other parts of Wisconsin. Um, yeah, I mean, hmm. Interesting. I'm not really, yeah, I'm not sure what the, what the angler demographics will be like uh, in some of these other streams um, across the state. Yeah. So my, I guess I, I don't have a really good guess for that one. Sure thing. Well, thank you so much for presenting. Um, yep. Really appreciate it. And, and fun to see back to back the two different states, uh, a little bit different structured creels, but, but similar demographics we see.